Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Fresh Dino Shadowing session. Today with us is Dr. Jessica Mosillier. She's a general dentist and implantologist, and she'll be sharing her insight. And then at the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A. So right. Dr. Mosillier, when you're ready. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm excited to be with everyone. So let's get started. This is me. I'm Dr. Jessica Mosillier. I'm a general dentist and implantologist. I work at Plant Center of Miami, which is um, Today, we're going to go through a little bit about my background, steps in applying to dental school, my long path to dentistry, and my quote unquote specialty. Um, and we'll go into why I put that in quotes. Um, my office, the team, a typical day at my office, and probably the most interesting part is case studies. I picked up uh, some of my favorite case studies that I'm going to share with you guys today. So this is my background. I went to the University of Florida. I got my degree in chemistry. I also have a degree in dental hygiene from Miami-Dade College. And then I have my doctorate from Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine, which is located in Bradenton, Florida. I chose LeCom because it was a fairly new dental school when I applied. I was actually the fourth graduating class. Um, the way that they presented their curriculum really intrigued me. And I also like the fact that patient treatment really started early on. It actually starts in your first year, second semester. Um, I also like that the last year at Lee Com, so the fourth year of dental school is treated more like a residency where it's 100% patient care. Um, there's no more classes, no more studying, well, except for boards, um, but you're just doing what you're trained to do, which is treating patients. All right, so these are some of my awards. Um, I was given the, or awarded the Dean's Award for my graduating class, which is only given to one student. Um, it's given to the student who shows like ethical responsibility, clinical skills, academic excellence. I was also awarded the Student Merit Award and an academic leader. Um, some of my previous awards were listed there. I was Phi Theta Kappa president and you know, you can read it. <laughs> I've also co-authored and authored several papers. Um, since I had a degree in chemistry, I was really into research. And so a little bit about me, um, for as long as I can remember, I really wanted to be a dentist. Dentist was my passion. Like I loved going to the dentist. I always had a really great experience. Um, but when I graduated from UF, I had an opportunity to just go straight into teaching, which I thought was a really good opportunity. I didn't have all of my prerequisites for dental school at the time. Um, so I taught middle school science, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Uh, I did that for two years, but then decided to go back on track. I became a surgical assistant at a periodontist office just to make sure that I, that's what I really liked. And I did, I loved it. So I worked at the periodontist for about the year I took some classes in anatomy and trying to finish all my dental school and an old that he was working at the Centers for Disease Control and my undergraduate research coincided with the research that they were working on at the CDC. So I applied, I got the job, I left Miami, I moved to Atlanta, I lived in Atlanta for three years and I worked as a chemist um, at the Centers for Disease Control in a the emergency response and air toxic branch. So basically what I did there was I analyzed blood, water, and urine for what's called volatile organic compounds, VOCs. Um, we worked as part of the NHANES project, the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, which basically gives you a baseline for the American population. Um, so basically we could tell you what's in your blood on a national average. And we actually wrote a paper on the biomarkers for cigarette use, which can be found in environmental, an environmental journal. Um, we also worked as the emergency response team. So if there was any natural disasters, terrorist attacks, we would be first responders. We collect samples, work 24 hours to get the results, kind of like the show 24, kind of like that. We'd work nonstop. Um, and so we had the, you know, the exposure that, that caused the issue. So these are some of my papers. Some of them are dental related, some of them not. Um, we ended up leaving the Atlanta in 2010 and then moved back to Miami. I 
couldn't apply to dental school at that time because it was January. So <laughs> I enrolled in the dental hygiene school. That's where I got my um, dental hygiene license My when I graduated or a month before I graduated. I had my son. He's eight years old now. And while he was a newborn, I was studying for the DAT. That was not easy, but we got it done. Um, I extensively studied for it. I ended up doing really well. And with my chemistry background, I ended up getting like a 29 and a 28 in the chemistry section, which I think the highest is 30. Um, and then a little while after I got accepted to LECOM. Um, the LECOM curriculum is uh, studies today. I think we learn more by doing than actually reading from a book. Um, you, you do need the basic knowledge, but case studies are really how, how I learned most of my, my dental um, education. So being a new mom, LECOM has a self-study. We do problem-based learning. We'd meet a couple, couple times a week, but I could self-study at home, which gave me the freedom to you know, be a dental student and be a mom at the same time. So that's a little bit about me. Um, every year when applying to dental school, it becomes more and more competitive. Um, it's not enough to have straight A's anymore. It's not enough to have like a, a high DAT score. You really need to be scoring in the 20s, even close to 30 if you can. Um, when I was applying this last, before I got it, did, um, were telling me it, everybody's getting straight A's. I have 3.9s, 4.0s, consistently students are scoring in the 30s for the DAT. So you have to add more to your resume. You have to show that you really want to be a dentist and why you want to be a dentist. So of course, the DAT is important. Focus on it, get all of the resources that you need, but you also want to make yourself stand out. How do you do that? You get involved in dentistry. So work at a dental office, um, go on mission trips, listen to these um, shadowing sessions. You wanted to develop your hand skills early, whether you're a musician or what, what it may be, you, you really want to start. Not that it's gonna help you on your resume for the application, but it'll help you once you're in dental school. And it's very common nowadays not to be accepted your first round and that's okay. Um, don't get discouraged. If dentistry is your dream, then keep at it. Find a way to beef up your resume, make yourself an interesting candidate, and find out if you have a dream school, find out exactly what they're looking for. Meet with the deans. You know, they'll, they'll be more than willing to, to talk to you. Um, then you could also get a master's instead of just applying with a bachelor's. I know a really good uh, master's as a master of biomedical science. Dental schools seem to really like that master's um, in their applicants. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Okay, so uh, technically I am a general dentist. However, shortly after graduating dental school, I joined a practice that specializes in placing implants. Um, so I became an implantologist and an implantologist is something, somebody that focuses on procedures having to do with the placement of implants. So I can see a patient from start to finish. If you need a tooth and extract, extract it, I'll do the extraction, I'll do the bone graft, I'll place the implants and I'll even place the prosthetic portion. So it makes it very convenient for patients because they don't have to be going to multiple offices. They can come see me and they stay with me until, until their treatment is finished. I also do the regular dentistry fillings, crowns, alignments, some root canals, um, but that's not the majority of my practice. I would say about 90% of my practice is related to implant dentistry. Um, currently, I'm registered with the International Congress of Oral Implantology, and I'm working on becoming an associate fellow with the American Academy of Implantology. So let's see. Um, I couldn't really decide at the end of dental school what I wanted to specialize in because I liked everything. I liked periodontics, I liked endodontics, I really liked oral surgery. So graduating, I decided to just stay as a general dentistry and see where my practice um, would lead me. And it, it really led me to a more surgical aspect. So here is my 
team at the office. Um, ICOM stands for Implant Center of Miami. On the left screen is me in the middle in the hot pink. We're celebrating one of my assistant's birthdays. Um, on the right, it, it's Dr. Herzog. She's actually the owner of the practices with one of my assistants, Felicia, and my husband and my son. And at the bottom is the three main doctors. We're, we originally were three females. So Dr. Herzog's in the middle. Um, I'm on the right. And Dr. Eve Libby is on the left. So I joined LECOM, I, 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 said, I would say in May 2020. And I've been loving it ever since. So I know a lot of you might have the question of corporate versus private practice. So there's benefits to both. Um, corporate dental offices really help you train you right out of dental school, especially when you're not at your quickest speed. Um, in dental school, you get two hours to do a filling. In the real world, I, I don't have that much time. So I did join a, a corporate dental office when I when I first graduated dental school, I was within a couple of months and then had the opportunity to switch over to private practice. Um, but I would then because they put all of this training into me. I learned how to use digital um, scanning, the CEREC machine to make in-house crowns. They um, had a mentor for me. They allowed me the chance to increase my speed. Uh, private practice is a little bit different. It's harder right out of dental school to join a private practice just because the timing between patients is a lot quicker and you're seeing a, a bigger load of patients. So in my office in Coral Gables, um, the staff consists of primarily me. Uh, I'm here five days a week and Dr. Herzog comes over one day a week on Wednesdays. Uh, we have four assistants and one part-time hygienist, an office manager, and two receptionists. The receptionist, one is assigned a check-in position, so she'll greet all the patients, make sure medical history is filled out, and then we have a checkout who, once the patients are done with their appointment, um, she'll make sure that they don't have any questions, give them any post-op procedures, and make sure that their medications are being sent to their pharmacy. We have six operatories, two large surgical suites, which you can see one on the bottom right, and three patient rooms and one hygiene room. Our lobby is over here to the left. We decorated for um, the for fall. <laughs> we also have an x-ray room, which has a panel slash CBCT. Uh, CBCT is like a three-dimensional imaging, which is crucial for placing implants because you really need to know not only how much height you have, but how much width of bone you have and any important structures like sinuses, nerves, which can be sometimes distorted in a two-dimensional image that we typically take. Um, in the middle, I have a picture of the Nomad machine, which is a, a wireless x-ray machine, which is really convenient. So we can take that from room to room and it's handheld. All right, so a typical day for me, um, I see a combination of patients. Mostly, um, I do surgery, like I said. So I have a whole row from sur for surgery. Um, on the next screen, I'll show you my blockouts. Um, there's assigned times where I have patients come in just to make the schedule run smoothly. I'll see new patients on the hour. So I have time to sit with them, really understand what they're coming to the office for, have that opportunity to connect with them. I'll see surgical patients on the half hour. So I could go numb the patient and then I'll see any post-ops or deliveries on the 45. So while my surgical patient's getting numb, I'm not just sitting around waiting for them. I'm actually flowing to another room. Um, each assistant is assigned a room and assigned a, um, a room. In a, yeah, each room is assigned an assistant and a procedure. So the goal is to keep everything flowing without much too much downtime. But you really need to have some sort of equilibrium because you need to have time to eat lunch, <laughs> which is really important. Some days I forget to have lunch, but that's not good. So you have to really force yourself to have that block. And I'll show you on my schedule on the next page, um, you know, to kind of like disconnect from from your day and then be able to go back in the afternoon. Um, you also need to have time to write your notes. You have to have your notes after every patient or at least at the end of the day so that you don't forget what the treatment was um, during the procedure. So I see it 
that's pretty much it. Um, let's go to the next page. So this is a blank screen of my schedule. Um, this is Open Dental. There's very there's a lot of different types of electronic health records. This is the one that we use. Some other popular ones are um, like Dexis, EagleSoft, and you can see how I added you know different colors from new patients, um, my surgery blocks, as well as the 15 to 30 minute post op appointments. Um, I also have blocks where you cannot book. So at one o'clock is typically when at one to one thirty is when I try to take my lunch. We have a column for our um, hygienist and she sees patients um, once an hour. Sometimes if she has a scaling or root planing, which is a deep cleaning, then we'll give her a little bit more time. All right, so let's jump into it. Um, here are the case studies that we're gonna go through. We're gonna start off with some cosmetic cases, uh, very simple to more complex. Then we'll go into extractions, um, which from fractures, periapical abscesses, and my favorite, the exploding tooth. We'll talk about what happens when you don't have enough bone for implant placement on upper arch rehabilitation and an all on four, depending on how much time we have. Um, just a little disclaimer before you go on, some of the images may be considered graphic uh, because they are part of my surgery. Um, uh, surgical records. Okay, so here's the cosmetic cases. First one, she's actually a friend of mine. Um, she has these white spots on her teeth. She's had them her whole life. Uh, they could be due to a variety of things, fluorosis, just um, when the teeth were developing, some enamel hypoplasia. Um, so before they were very difficult to get rid of. You can't whiten your teeth to get rid of them because the more you whiten your teeth, the whiter the spots are gonna get. So there's a new product called Icon Infiltrate, which is minimally invasive. That means I don't have to drill your tooth. All we used is an etch, which is an acid, to make these micro pores in the teeth, um, really open up the, the cells so that the white spot kind of disappears. So we did a couple rounds of that and after I was satisfied with the way that the white spots were appearing, you cover it with an unfilled resin, kind of like a composite that you use for regular fillings, but it's more liquidy. And here we have the results. So it's not 100%. Um, we could probably go back and do some touch up on the canines, but there's a big difference. Um, the four main teeth have pretty much gotten rid of the, of the white spots. All right, here's the next patient. Um, she had lots of cavities and and stains on her on her teeth. She actually drove down from Orlando to visit us uh, because we could do same day crowns. Not in my office, but we have actually several offices. There's one in Bay Harbor and one in Sunrise uh, where they have the mill. So I was actually working in the Bay Harbor office and she just really wanted to fix her smile. She was a very pretty lady um, and she was really um, self-conscious about her, her crown her teeth. So we ended up doing four crowns. I got rid of all of the decay. Um, and here's the result. So the four front, so lateral to lateral are new crowns. And we prep them, scan them, milled them all the same day in about two hours, I would say. Okay, this next patient, he came to the office because he was missing a tooth. Um, you can actually see when you're looking at the photo, he has a very large defect where the tooth is missing. So either he had a traumatic incident where he had a lot of bone loss, or he didn't have a bone graft when he lost the tooth, or he had a condition called periodontal disease um, that wasn't treated, which ended up leading to tooth loss. He, this patient was adamant about not having an implant. So he wanted a bridge. We ended up doing a four unit bridge from lateral to lateral to mask the, the defect and added a little pink porcelain. So here's the final result. Um, you wanna really try to match the color as much as possible to the adjacent teeth. Sometimes it's very difficult. Teeth are very multicolored. Um, so, and porcelain is not porcelain, it's one color. So you have to be very specific with the lab if you want incisal translucency, if you want different shading, um, and if you want pink gingiva. If not, sometimes the lab can leave the, the contacts and the interproximals tooth colored. All right. 
So this is my last cosmetic case. Um, it's veneers. It's probably the most difficult cosmetic case that I've done to date. And the reason is that this patient came in and he wanted veneers. He wanted to change the way his smile looks. But when you're looking at his preoperative photo, you can automatically point your vision to the canines. The canines are very high up. His smile in the front is kind of arched. His teeth are very short, very worn down. I tried to talk to him about going into ortho to align his teeth a little bit more, but he did not want it. He wanted something quick and he wanted it to look good. Um, he knew that it wasn't going to be perfect because of where the canines were, but I said, all right, let's go ahead and do it. <laughs> so first what we did is a diagnostic wax up where we take impressions of what his teeth actually look like. We send that to the lab and then they send me back a model of what they think the would look good for the patient. And we try that in kind of as a mock-up. And if we need to make any changes, we do. If not, we go ahead and prep the same day. And then we use that digital wax up as a stent for his temporaries. So here's his final, which you can still see the canines are very high up, but the teeth are more in alignment. Um, these blue marks that you see on the bottom is the way that we check the bite. And you don't want to see any of those heavy marks because veneers don't go all around your tooth like a crown does. It's just like a shell, like an acrylic nail. Um, any high marks, and you could probably, they'll be popping off the veneers. Okay, so now on to some of my favorite things, which are extractions. So the first case we're going to talk about is something called a vertical root fracture. So patient comes in, he tells me my tooth is broken. I, another dentist had told him it was broken and he needed to have it extracted. So most of the time before I see a new patient, what I do is I'll take a look at the x-rays. Um, I want to know before I go talk to them what's going on. That way I have an idea and I'm already formulating a treatment plan in my head. So with vertical root fractures, um, they're typically not visible on x-rays unless they've been around for a long time. If, the, if it is visible on an x-ray, they have a lesion called a J lesion, which you can actually see it on the right x-ray. Um, it starts on the left side of the tooth and wraps around. It's kind of like an upside down J. And you can actually, and you can see the abscess on the other, on the left side. Um, once a tooth has a vertical root fracture, it's actually considered hopeless. There's nothing that you can do for the tooth. The crack goes all the way down. That means there's a way for bacteria to enter, um, enter the cavity and cause, cause issues. So if a vertical root fracture is suspected, then the treatment is extraction. <coughs> Excuse me. So most vertical root fractures happen on second molars because of the chewing forces. Um, also, root canal treated teeth tend to have more vertical root fractures than non, non root canal treated. And that's because once you have a root canal on the tooth, you tend to have a more brittle tooth. Sometimes you'll have these posts in there that will cause breakage. <coughs> Um, so on that left picture, we're looking at the last tooth in the mouth. You can actually see these little white spikes coming in and it looks like the crown is separated. So I'm already thinking before I see the patient, okay, this tooth is root canal, has a J-shaped lesion, it's fractured. So before he even told me it was broken, I pretty much knew it was broken. So there's the crown separation. Okay, let's see. I don't have a picture. Oh, I don't have a picture of the... Let's see, maybe my internet is slow. No, I don't have a picture of it. Okay. Um, I really like this case because when I took the tooth out, the whole abscess came out whole. It was, it was really interesting. I've never seen anything like it. Um, and when I was cleaning the socket, you can see the blue hue of the sinus cavity. And that's actually very dangerous because if you perforate the sinus, um, depending on the size of the perforation, the patient can stay with an oral antral communication. Um, you really don't, don't want that. All right, so next we have a periapical abscess. Patient comes in, tells me her tooth is very loose. 
and she needs it extracted. So I take an x-ray, I look at it and I say, okay, well, this tooth has no bone. I can see why, why it's pretty loose. But when I'm looking at the quality of bone, I'm looking, wow, there's really not much bone left. So my concern here is not only for the infection in the, in the tooth, around the tooth, but how am I gonna restore this in the future? She wants an implant, but the, currently there's not enough to place an implant. <coughs> Excuse me. So we take the tooth out and this is the extracted tooth on the right. And you can see the large periapical abscess. So this is called a periapical radiolucency or PARL for short. And it came out in one piece. I actually sent this to biopsy because I was concerned about how large it was. Excuse me. Um, and it ended up coming back as granulation tissue, which is just an inflammatory process from the infection. So I took the tooth out. Now, in order to grow this bone, I needed to do a procedure called guided tissue regeneration, where I'm not only packing the socket with allograft, which is cadaver bone, but I'm using a collagen membrane to wrap this bone to make sure that the gum tissue doesn't infiltrate the socket. Because if the gum tissue infiltrates the socket, the bone graft won't take, and you'll have this like mushy bone, and we won't have enough space for an implant. So typically when there's an infection like this, it takes about six months, sometimes more for the patient to heal. Um, and this patient is waiting for her implant place. So she's actually should be coming this month to have her implant place. Um, something that you can help the process along is with plasma rich fibrin or PRF, um, which is when we draw the patient's blood and spin it out, use the plasma and make a little membrane in it to help the body heal. Um, this is after the bone graft and you can see Actually, I think the CT was taken last month. Um, you can actually see how much bone we've grown. And we have 10 millimeters of, of vertical height to place an implant, which is sufficient. All right, so now my personal favorite as far as extraction goes, the exploding tooth. So this patient came in when I was working at the corporate dental office. Um, he came in because he was in an extensive amount of pain. He couldn't sleep, it couldn't work. Um, if you're looking at the panoramic, it's the tooth, the lower right molar or the one with the big hole in it. Um, he, we took his blood pressure and we couldn't do anything for him. His blood pressure was very high, partly because he was in pain, but he also admitted that he's supposed to take uh, blood pressure medication and he had not been taking it. So I actually dismissed him that day. Um, because I couldn't treat him. Uh, the reason I couldn't treat him was because in order to anesthetize him and to properly clean out the infection, I need to be able to control blood. Um, the way that I do that is by injecting medications, anesthesia that have epinephrine in it. Epinephrine will cause an increase in blood pressure. So if you already have a high blood pressure, then you're at cardiovascular risk for either a stroke or a heart attack. Um, my personal number is if the systolic is over 160, 165, and the diastolic is over 95, um, I, I won't treat the patient. So the patient ended up going home and taking his blood pressure medication, and he came back at the end of the day as we were walking out, and I was like, come on, let's, let's go and take it out. Um, I did want to tell you about something called the rule of 300. So if a patient's blood pressure, the diastolic plus the systolic peak, equals over 300, they immediately need to go to the ER because they're at very high risk for myocardial infraction or heart attack. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, especially if you are wanting to go into dentistry. Um, I take blood pressure on every single one of my patients. So, all right, so we ended up taking the tooth out. The tooth came out fairly quickly, um, but as I am luxating the tooth, which means I'm kind of coercing it to come out, um, it starts spewing out pus. Um, and I actually have a video of it. So I'm going to show here's the tooth. And here's our video. 
So this is after the extraction and you can see the cavity and you can see just a little pool of pus that had come out while I was extracting. It was the first and has not happened since, um, but the patient was very happy that we were able to take it out. All right, so now we're gonna talk about preparing for an implant. So what happens if there is not enough bone to place an implant, whether it's vertical height or horizontal height? So this patient came in, she really wanted an implant for her front tooth. Um, she had had a traumatic incident as a child and ended up losing her front tooth. Uh, she had been to another dental office. They had tried to place an implant twice um, and were unable to. So I took a CT scan and this is the CT scan on the left. You can see her ridge looks kind of like a mountain um, and it's very, very thin. I think it measured about 2.85. Um, so we did a procedure called a ridge augmentation. A ridge augmentation is exactly what it sounds like. You're creating bone with so that you have a place for the implant. Um, so how much bone is needed to place an implant? So my narrowest implant is 3.3 millimeters. Um, the thickest one is five millimeters. So I can't have 3.3 or five. I need to have some bone in front and I need to have some bone in back. So the minimum that you should have is one millimeter in front and one millimeter in back. Um, that way you have good stability for the implant, good support, and you have minimal risk of the bone resorbing around the implant. You also wanna look at height. So my shortest implant is six millimeters, which I've never used. Um, those are only in extreme cases uh, where the patient is really adamant about having an implant placed and there's not enough structure. But typically I tend to shoot for a 10 millimeter, 11 and a half millimeter if I can. Um, they go all the way up to 16 millimeters. So, <clears throat> all right, so the deficient ridge measured actually 2.5 by 15.88. So there's not enough width, but I had enough height, which is good. Um, so what we did is the ridge augmentation. In order to do that, we do a full thickness flap, which means we lift up all of the tissue, including the periosteum, hitting, um, visualizing the bone itself. Then we do something called osteo perforations with a surgical handpiece. And this is to induce bleeding. Why do I want bleeding? Because bleeding will allow for my allograft, the bone grafting, to take. So. I use two different types of bone grafting when we do ridge augmentation. We do allograft, which is cadaver bone, and we also do xenograft, which xenograft is um, from animals. There's several different type, other different types. There's autograft, which comes from the person, um, and alloplast. But typically, I just use allograft and xenograft. Um, we also use PRF in this case, and we mix it all together. I did the osteo perforations, built the bone, um, and then placed the membrane. So this is the post-op CT, and you can see um, all of the graft material in the front. Now, all of the graft material doesn't say you do get some loss, but after implant placement, I mean, after the ridge augmentation, there was about 6.7 millimeters of bone. Um, so once you do a ridge augmentation, you want to wait about six months before you go back in there just to make sure that the bone is solidified. Sometimes you can wait up to nine months. So here is at the six month mark. We lost about one millimeter, but they're still sufficient for implant placement. Um, so we went ahead and placed the implant. You always have to take a CT before you place the implant because depending on how much time has passed, you want to make sure you have the right amount of bone and you need to take measurements for your implant. So we're good to go here. Um, the bone looks dense. And the way that I know that is that there's not a lot of air pockets. There's not a lot of blackness in the CT scan. So here's my implant. Um, when I place the implant, you don't wanna go into your graft because there's a possibility that the graft could fracture off. You actually wanna go into the native bone. So, for these cases, I like to plan them out. I don't use a surgical guide most of the time, actually never. Um, I'll refer the patients out if I need to use a surgical guide, but you want to go into the native bone. So I plan with my software exactly where I need to go. And then you just open, visualize the bone 
and go ahead and please say so you can actually the implant looks like it's smiling upside down um, all in the native bone and you can see the graft in the front again we're going to wait six months to make sure that the implant takes um, and then restore so that's where this patient's at um, we're waiting until december so, until she can get her crown here's the, the graft all right, so all on X. So the traditional form or the original form was called all on four. When it first came out, it was basically you took out somebody, all of somebody's teeth and replaced them with four implants. Um, now we really try to do six, sometimes more, seven, eight if we can, but the minimum to support a prosthetic is four implants. So this patient initially came for a different treatment. He had a bridge that had a cavity on it. Again, root canals with a post, it was fractured. Um, it also had recurrent decay. So at this point, he's like, well, I can't have another bridge because he had a bridge on the other side of it. So he wanted individual implants. So we were gonna put three implants, but all the way to the right, you can see the sinus is dropping. So I didn't have enough vertical height to, to place an implant. So we did something called a vertical sinus lift, where at the time of implant placement, you gently bump up the floor of the sinus and again, place allograph and PRF, and then place your implant. Typically, these implants have to wait four to six months as well. So that's the fractured tooth. There's the low sinus. And these are the implants after I place them. Um, this line right here, that's how much I lifted. I didn't really need to lift much. I needed to lift maybe like two millimeters, um, but that's sufficient enough to support the implant. I also want to mention that when you're placing implants next to each other, they have to have three millimeters apart. They need to be three millimeters apart or you'll lose interproximal bone on them. So once we place these three implants, we are waiting um, for the extraction site to heal before placing the fourth. And during this time, the patient started having other issues. Um, his teeth started to break in other places, crowns were coming off. So I sat down with him and I talked about how I really thought that an all on four would be the best bet for him moving forward. Um, because we were really trying to play catch up with some old dentistry that was starting to, to give. Um, so here we have the patient after we did the first three implants, I, I did a temporary bridge in the front because his teeth were, the laterals broke off, um, and he was going on vacation. But when he came back, we ended up doing the, the all on four procedure. So let's see, here's the x-ray after the all on four, we ended up placing four more implants, um, on the, on the right side. He had very poor quality of bone. You can see um, a space between the three implants, the three original implants and the four secondary implants. So we just left that area alone. You don't really need it. He had a really good span um, for the prosthetic. I also left his molars because they were in pretty good shape. And while he was healing in his temporary denture, it gave the denture more support. Um, Typically with the all on four procedures, the, the denture is really the most uncomfortable part of the procedure for the patient because it's this big chunk of plastic in their mouth um, that they have to take in and out every day. It's very psychological for them because now they've lost all of their teeth. Um, and that's something very, very difficult to get, uh, to get used to. So um, for the all on four, what we do is, or what we try to do is take out the teeth and place the implants at the same time. This will help the patient in terms of time. Um, usually it'll save them three to four months of healing. So here, that's what we did. We took out the teeth, placed the implants, we waited four months, and then we started the prosthetic portion, which typically is about five visits. First, you take the initial impressions, um, the lab sends back verifications of where the implants are. Then we do a wax try-in where we take the bite, then the lab sets the teeth in wax, make sure that the patient likes the color, likes the shape. Then they'll get a temporary fixed denture called a PMMA. It's an acrylic denture um, fixed to the implants where they wear that for two weeks to four weeks. We make sure that the bite is okay, that there's no changes that they wanna make as far as the aesthetics. And then they'll get a zirconia bridge or a different type of acrylic bridge that is more permanent. 
And here's the post-operative photo. So you can see more congruency. He has a really nice smile now. We decided to go a little bit wider than, than he was uh, originally. And that's it. So I want to say thank you guys for having me here. Um, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> All right, thank you so much, doctor. That was an awesome presentation. Um, so I think we can get started with the questions now, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so our first question was, do you ever get any cases that bother you in terms of blood or anything similar? Like maybe in the beginning when you started off? Absolutely. So <laughs> my, <laughs> my very first surgery as a surgical assistant, I had to walk out of the room because I thought I was going to pass out. Um, it is something that you get used to. If it, surgery is something that you want to do, you'll get used to it. Um, the only way that I got used to it is by doing it every day. And sometimes patients do bleed. Patients bleed a lot, especially if they're on blood thinners. Um, there's ways to control it. Most of the bleeding in the mouth can be controlled with intraoral pressure. We also have anesthetic with high amounts of epinephrine. We have blood stop, bone wax, different ways to control it. Okay. Um, and then also, like, do you have any tips for connecting and like building relationships with your patients and like just kind of making them feel comfortable with the process? Mm -hmm. So when patients come to me, they're really, they're very scared. They haven't been to the dentist in quite a long time. Um, they're needing a lot of dental work. And the biggest thing for me is just listen to them. They want somebody to understand what they're going through. They want somebody to be compassionate with them. Um, and that's, and that's what I do. I sit with them. If they're scared, I'll hold their hands. Um, I'll make sure if I'm injecting them and they're scared of the needles that my assistant's holding their hand, we try to make the, the process as comfortable to them as possible. Um, okay. And then do you have, have you had any cases where you've had to like work with another dental specialist and like, kind of what does that process look like? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I work with periodontists, I've worked with orthodontists, with oral surgeons, um, endodontists a lot, which do root canals. Um, so typically how that works is a new patient will come to my office and I'll come up with a treatment plan. If for example, a patient needs a root canal that, that I won't do because the molar is curved or it has a funky look to it, I'll fill out a referral slip and I have a set of referrals depending on where the patient lives. Um, where I'm gonna send them. And I'll fill it out, tell the specialist exactly what I would like done and the patient will go see them. The specialist will send me a report back. Uh, this goes for any specialist, orthodontists, um, oral surgeons also. I work a lot also with ENTs since we do sinus lifts. Um, if the sinus has like sinusitis or congestion, we won't be able to do a sinus lift. Sometimes we'll have to have a sinus drainage before. Okay, um, and then we have some questions in the YouTube live chat. Somebody said, could you please explain to me whether a diabetes patient with unstable HbA1c can have implants? So, no. It, well, actually, it depends on the A1c. You really want your A1c as close to five or six as possible. Um, if they're higher than seven, I won't place an implant because they're a very high risk for failure and infection. So if somebody is diabetic, they need to get their A1C under control first. Okay, um, and then somebody else asked, what do you recommend for developing hand skills? Everybody's different. So find something that you like, whether it's drawing, um, paint. I used to paint a lot. Um, I also play violin and piano. So whatever you like, pick up a hobby. Um, you need a way to de-stress anyway. <laughs> Just make it something with hand skills. <laughs> Um, and then like kind of going back to your dental school journey, um, mm -hmm. what is something that you did to like manage your time? Cause I know it can be really hectic. Yes. So it was very difficult. Um, I looked at dental school like a job. So my son was in daycare. I would drop him off at eight o'clock. I would go to school at right after whether I had classes or not. And I would sit in the library until five o'clock. Um, and I would, you know, stop, pause my studying until in between classes, but I was there every day, eight to five, whether I had classes or not studying, just making sure that I was covering everything that I needed to cover um, and learning everything that I needed to for the test. 
One thing that I did want to mention was when I went to hygiene school, that really helped me with my first year because I already had a basis in dental anatomy. Um, I had a basis in pharmacology. So I could really focus on other aspects of dental school in the first year that I wasn't as strong in. Um, on the weekends, I my husband would come into town and I would spend my whole weekend studying. So you really need to prioritize. You need to set a schedule for yourself. Um, Everybody is different. So you have to find something that works for you. Maybe you're a night owl and you like to stay up late. Just you have to dedicate the time. The first two years of dental school are the most difficult because that's when you're doing all of your basic sciences. You're learning all of this new terminology. Um, And that's something that's really important because it's going to be with you for the rest of your, your career. Um, Okay, and then overall, what would you say was um, the hardest part of dental school? (laughs) The hardest part? Um, I would say taking the boards exam. (laughs) For me, I was so nervous taking my boards exams. We have uh, both written and clinical boards. It's not like medical school where everything is exams. Um, We actually have to do patient treatment. And for me, the last exam that I took was my patient treatment where I had to do two different types of fillings. I had to do a deep cleaning. And that was so nerve wracking for me. Um, Even though I knew (laughs) that I knew what to do still, I felt like everything was riding on this exam. The last four years of my life, my whole future was riding on this exam. So don't stress out like me, but (laughs) um, you can do it. Okay, and then like kind of going along your pre-dental journey, um, do you have any interview tips? Because I know it's like interview season right now for pre-dentals mm-hmm. um, or like how to stand out during an interview. Mm-hmm. So interviews tend to be different at different schools. Um, at LeCom, you are in a group of 10 and it's very hard to stand out in a group of 10. I know at LeCom, they don't want you to, um, let's say overpower the interview. But what they want is to see how you interact with other people because your problem-based learning, which is how you get your basic sciences, is in a group of 10. Um, So you need to learn how to express yourself when you want to express yourself and learn how to stay quiet, at least in that setting. Um, At Nova, I think it's one-on-one. And that's a little bit more intimidating because you're here with this dental school professor that you really want to attend the school with. And it's just you asking um, them, asking all of these different questions. And for me, the biggest thing is just be yourself. Um, Show them what you can bring to the school. Show them how you can make their school better, Um, whether it's implementing a new program at the school, a new club, whatever. Um, and then someone asked, how do you manage to pay dental school, pay back dental school loans? And do you have any advice on like how to lower student debt or like, do you know of any scholarships? So dental school is very expensive. Um, and it just keeps getting more expensive. Um, I am still paying off my student loans. Well, we're in forbearance right now, but, um, you just, pay as you go. When you first get out of dental school, you do an income-based payment plan. So they basically look at your income and they analyze how much you can pay. Um, they're not, you're not going to be paying like $5,000 a month on a $400,000 loan. You have 10 years to pay your loan and they'll work with you to kind of manage it out. There are some schools that offer scholarships, you can definitely look into that. There's also Army um, that they'll cover your costs, Army, um, Air Force, all of those, Navy. Um, when you graduate, you can also work for uh, public health and they'll give you in, um, loan repayment programs. Um, it depending on the program is how much. Some of them are 20,000 a year, some of them are 10,000. Okay, got you. And then um, what would you say is like the biggest difference between practicing like in dental school and then in the real world? Um, The number of patients that you see. So in dental school, I would see two patients a day. Um, Today, I probably saw 10 patients. Uh, Sometimes I see more. So dental school is basically to learn the ideal. And then once you're out in the real world, you have to learn how to speed up and take everything that you learn in dental school, but do it. 10 times the speed. 
Okay. Um, and then someone asked, what factors should one consider when applying to like a residency or a dental school? Like, what are the main factors? Um, I'm sorry, it broke up a little bit. Uh, main factors in applying to dental school or residency? Yeah, like when you're like as an applicant, what should you look for in a school? Like, what are the main factors? Um, so everybody's different. For me, geographic location was really important because I was a non-traditional student. I was married with a kid and I wanted to be close to my family. So location was number one for me. Um, I wanted to stay in state or in somewhere that my husband could easily travel to on the weekends from work. Um, you also want to look at the curriculum. What are they teaching you? Um, some schools are teaching Botox. Some schools are teaching Invisalign. You really have to think about what you want to get out of your dental school. Um, some have state-of-the-art technology. For me, I like the curriculum at LeCom because of the problem-based learning. I also like that they were a new facility. So they had new technology. Um, the clinics were brand new. Everything was clean. Um, but like I said previously, it's very hard to get into dental school. You're going to learn the fundamental basics of dentistry at whatever school you go to. So if you apply to 10 schools and you're, you don't get accepted to your number one choice, that's okay. You're still going to get an amazing dental school education. Um, great advice. And then someone asked about like your most challenging or memorable procedure, um, that you've done thus far. Wow. <laughs> um, let's see. I've done a lot. I sorry, I have patients calling. Um, so I would say probably my first all on four was very memorable for me because it's not a short procedure. Um, it's not something that you're in and out in 10 minutes. You're in here in the surgical suite with the patients for hours. Um, I did something called an overdenture yesterday which is similar to an all in four, but it's not with a fixed prosthesis. I was with the patient for four hours. Um, so I would say that those are the most challenging um, because it's mentally exhausting. You're in a surgical procedure. You've got to make sure you're not hitting any nerves, not hitting any arteries. You're wanting to plan these implants to be perfectly parallel because if not, the, the denture won't grab. So. Okay, um, and then last question here. Um, what, what is one thing you wish you knew before starting dental school? What is one thing I wished I knew? I did the like you can just like, give any, uh, any last advice. Like what is one thing you wish you knew before starting dental school? So it really depends. Um, Going into dental school, I was very different. I was one of the older students. Um, so I had already been in the workforce and I knew what I wanted out of dental school. I knew that I wanted to be top of my class just in case I wanted to specialize. And that's something that you have to think about. If you want to specialize, you have to be at the top of your class, especially for orthodontics. Orthodontics is probably one of the toughest residencies to get into. Um, now they're doing something called the ADAT if you want to be a resident, um, if you want to go specialize, which is similar to the DAT, but specifically for um, continuing post doctorate, your postdoctorate degree. So I would say once you graduate from college, enjoy your summer, give it all to your DAT. That's really, really important. Um, and once you're in dental school, give it your all um, because it's not a time to fool around. It's time to learn, time to take in everything that you can from your professors because once you're a dentist, it's all on you. There's not gonna be anybody to hold your hand. Um, so if you're goofing off and not learning what, what you should, it could really cause, cause you know, damage to the patient, especially if you're doing surgery, you could nick the lingual artery, somebody could bleed out. Um, it's actually very dangerous. All right. Thank you so much, doctor. Those are all the questions we had. And yeah, we really, really appreciate your time and all of your responses. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, feel free to contact me. Um, my Instagram is at Dr. Snow Whitening or Implant Center of Miami, that's the office. You can email with me with any questions. I'm always available by email. I will get back to 
everybody who has any questions. And if you feel like you have another question that didn't get answered during the presentation, please don't be shy to email me. I love helping pre-dental students, um, especially because I had such a long path to dental school. I feel like um, I can help whoever whoever's interested. All right, thanks again, doctor. All right, have a great night, guys. You too.